Hi, everybody. Welcome to week 24 of ENM 2020. Uh, this week, we're talking about model selection, and we have three neat talks uh, from three different uh, research groups. So it should be a, a rich discussion. We have one of the three speakers with us, um, and we have questions and answers from uh, another of them. Um, but just wanted to give you a quick preview of next week, uh, which is to say we're going to interrupt the um, course videos for one week. And on Monday morning, I will do a Zoom session that will be open to the participants, which is to say you can join it and um, talk live. Um, the idea is to have some back and forth about uh, how the course is going and what's working and what isn't. Um, and then also a bit of discussion about how to evaluate the participation um, of the participants, um, because I know a bunch of you are hoping for certificates from the course. With the COVID-19 mess, uh, I don't think we can uh, do it the way we did the Spanish language course a year, a year and a half ago, where we simply made sure that everybody was asking questions each week. Um, but I think everybody's had so much turmoil in his or her life that we don't want to do it that way. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that on Monday. I've already sent via Twitter, Facebook, and the email. Um, I've sent the links to the online session. So um, grab those links. You have to grab the password as well. And please do not share the links openly on social media because there is this phenomenon of Zoom bombing. Um, and it's basically just, I guess, people who are bored and have nothing better to do um, cause trouble for people who are trying to hold meetings online. So again, don't, don't share the links openly, um, but do please try to make sure that you can join us and, and um, talk a bit. So that's next week. This week, for this week, we have um, this idea of model selection. And maybe I'll just give a, a tiny background. Um, but you know, certainly Dan Warren has done a better job of giving a background. But just in this field of distributional ecology and ecological niche modeling, uh, for a long time, people were content with the idea of essentially setting up a model fitting uh, experiment, choosing the parameter settings of the models, pressing the button and interpreting what came out. And they did that either because they didn't know that there were options or because they thought that they were getting the right parameter settings. Um, and maybe they were, but um, I at least don't know of a good way to eyeball that and guess and you know, use prior experience to figure out um, the best set of model parameter values. So um, along came Dan Warren in, in 2012 uh, with, a, with a student named Seifert. I assume student, sorry if it wasn't. Um, but Warren and Seifert threw out this idea of why aren't we doing model selection in niche modeling the same as we do in, for example, multivariate statistics. And it was a very good idea and it's taken off. And I think nowadays it would be pretty hard to publish a uh, niche modeling paper that doesn't include some dimension of model selection. How do you, how do you guys feel, Mona and Marlon, about, you know, is, is this now the, the order of the day or does the old system still work?
I was going to let you talk, Marlon, since you gave a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's necessary to do. I review papers, and I I always recommend to uh, at least try a simple model uh, tuning or model calibration exercise before deciding in the parameters if they don't have it. Uh, because we don't know. Maxon is a, at least Maxon is a very uh, strong algorithm, but it has so many options. So you, you have to test at least some of them and see which ones work better for your question and ID in species, of course, because depending on each species, you will have different results. And the same can happen for other algorithms, but parameters are different and need to be explored. I think we have, you know, we have a class or a category of users that have been in the field for a while and they are, they are aware and I think they are implementing uh, calibration more, more often and more sophisticatedly than, uh, than first time users because it is, it is tempting to uh, run Maxent, you know, the GUI interface with the you know, Java <laughs> interface with just uh, the default without clicking on those advanced options and the, the multiple, the three tabs that come with the uh, advanced. I think that's, I think that it's a bit, um, I mean, it's, the interface is simple so that people uh, can use, use fast to that, uh, that you know, uh, Java interface, but if you don't, if you don't check the uh, options, then you never see that. Oh, there's actually I can do cross cross validation. I can do uh, bootstrapping. I can do yeah. It's it's a bit. Um, uh, I guess it takes a bit more time for for new users to to actually get into calibration. So. Okay, let's let's look at some questions then. And so Dan Warren sent me uh, written answers to questions. Uh, so if you put up a question that was directed at Dan, uh, I will put a summary of those responses in the additional materials on the um, on the course page. So let, let's look at some of the questions. There we are. Okay. Um, you guys have anything that jumped off the page at you? I highlighted some questions, but if you, so I didn't understand well, are you gonna answer the questions that were for Dan based I, I on what he sent? I'll put out, I'll put up Dan's responses um, just as a document, and anybody who asked a question directly to Dan can um, go and and read those. Um, and then I'll also, um, if we run out of gas with with our own answers, I will um, read them at the end of of the course. Read some of them at the end of the course. So so let let's go ahead and and do this live as much as is um, is useful, okay? So if you guys have questions that you'd like to take on, let's do that live because my reading Dan's written answers is as good as uh, the participants reading Dan's written answers, okay? Yep. Well, there was a question that I didn't highlight, but it was interesting. It was about, uh, why are we told that some metrics are wrong for evaluating models and still we're using it? And I guess they're referring to AUC or some other metrics that are sometimes applied to background model, models that use background, but in doesn't have, and they don't have absences and we still use like uh, TSS is, or other metrics that require knowing something about the absence of the species. 
<clears throat> and I don't know, uh, probably Dan mentioned some of those uh, metrics in, during his presentation. And I guess it's okay to be informed about different metrics and what do they do. And some metrics are not good for Maxim, but they may be good for some other examples and some other algorithms that do require and do have uh, interaction with person's absence values. And like there, there's few people that can do that, but there are people that actually have some absences and they have certainty in the absences. So I guess it's okay to, to know what they are about. And that's why some presentations uh, show you how to use them or what are they about. And about AUC, <clears throat> that's that's a metric that I think has been the most uh, criticized probably, and and somehow some some modeling exercise still use it, and I have seen papers using it. And I think the correct the correct idea is at least not to use it as a as a measure of uh, model performance depending on the value uh, and of course there is partial rock that tries to fix that problem and just say whether it's a measure uh, that is a, a measure of statistical significance or not and uh, that that's what I can say I mean don't be afraid of the metrics just be aware of what they do and try to use the ones that correspond to your modeling practice, for your modeling exercise. Maybe I'll be a little bit more clear. You, you were very um, um, diplomatic, Marlon. Um, but I'm, I'm usually a little bit more reckless in my commentaries. Um, I think there are three reasons why people use those metrics. One of them is that you know, AUC is readily and immediately a very available in the Maxent output. It just pops up. So why wouldn't you use it? Um, what a lot of people don't understand is that what pops up and is presented to you at the end of your modeling is a pretty bad measure of model quality or model significance or anything, which is to say, if you don't deliberately set aside a random testing percentage, then that AUC value that pops up in your Maxent output is an AUC based on the occurrence data that were used to fit the model. So essentially, how well does my model predict the data that were used to create my model? It's entirely and completely circular and it's entirely and completely inappropriate. So that's one reason why people uh, use those metrics because they're there and they're easy. A second reason is the literature, which is to say we have this enormous body of literature. And I think one, one thing that people don't always get is that the, the literature is, is a thing that evolves through time. And so if I look at the, the things that people in that field, you know, myself and others, were doing 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it's it's pretty frightful, okay? Doesn't mean it was bad science. At the time, it was the best thing that we could do with, with the best tools that we had. And you know, you both know I'm not I'm not at the frontier of tool use just because I'm I'm technically limited. But um, what I try to do in my research and and guide my students to do in their research is to use the best tools available or the most appropriate tools available at that moment. But for somebody coming in from outside, um, 
or somebody who's you know, just jumping into this field, you look at the literature and you see, oh, well, here's a paper that's been cited 6,000 times. I'll use that tool or I'll follow that example. But to accumulate 6,000 citations, the paper's been around for 10 years. And so that means it's probably kind of out of date. So, you know, the, the Elif et al. paper in ecography, it's been cited six or 7,000 times. Um, in its moment, it was a, it was a influential paper that, that really gave a benchmark that centered the field and restarted a lot of discussions. But it's now 14 years old. And so it's not an appropriate guide for the set of methods we should be using in our studies now. Third reason is I think there's a lot of people who still don't get the difference between presence only data and presence absence data. And that's a pretty serious thing. We've, we've been talking about that since the beginning of this course, maybe a little subtly, which is to say, maybe we haven't been clear and emphatic enough. But for the vast majority of ecological niche modeling analyses, what we have is presence data and presence data only. In a few instances, people have absence data. But you have to remember, remember back to the BAM diagram, it's Absence because it is outside of A. Absence because it's not part of the fundamental ecological niche. Not absence because it's outside of B, the biotic interactions, and not absence because it's inaccessible outside of M. It has to be absence because it's not in a place that manifests the suitable conditions for the species. That's one thing. Um, we almost never have reliable absence data. No species is 100% detectable. And so we generate absence data by either not going to a place and therefore not finding and reporting the species or going to the place and not finding the species and therefore reporting absence. Or even going and finding the species there but not reporting it. And so if we only have presence data, where does the absence dimension come from for a rock or for a kappa or a, a TSS or any of those measures? The absence data are invented in the vast majority of cases. Now that's not accusing people of fraud or anything. They're invented because the algorithms invent them. Okay? And those algorithms have to do with how do we fit a model? How do we threshold a model? How do we evaluate a model? All of those approaches if they're using absence data, the absence data don't exist. They never did and they never will. It's in one or 2% of the studies in this field that we actually have absence data, real, reliable, trustable absence data. And so I think people need to, uh, this is a really good question by the way, People need to be conscious of the fact that if you don't have really high quality curated absence data that you developed under really rig rigorous assumptions, then you do not have absence data and you should not be using metrics or methods that need absence data. Was that clear? <laughs> yeah, I 
I was gonna say that sometimes, I mean, it happened to me a couple of times where a reviewer insists on, not insists, but requires to report TSS because TSS, uh, speaking of literature, you know, you, you said how we shouldn't rely on old re literature for methodological, you know, advancements. And then um, I can't remember when the TSS method uh, was proposed, but more recently, let's say, I don't know, after 2010, I don't remember exactly when. And um, so that caught on <laughs> the TSS metric. And a couple of times I had to use it, I had to add it to my manuscripts because uh, a reviewer requested that I, I also report TSS. Right. And I think, I think that that is not a good idea to do because we just perpetuate misuse of, of methods. So instead of me giving in, what I should have done is I should have said, okay, TSS is based on specificity and sensitivity. I cannot calculate specificity because I do not have absence data. So I should have argued a little bit because it is a small detail, you know, you know if, if nothing else, if that's one of the small things that you are required to change, change, you could, or I should have um, argued and not added TSS to my, you know, paper. <laughs> I, I do when I, the two times that I, I think it was two times that I had to do that, I do explain that it's actually based on, you know, you know, it's clear the, uh, the equation tells you that it, it has absence, that it's based on absence data. So anyhow, it's interesting that push we get to do things we don't, we shouldn't be doing in yeah. literature. <laughs> Reviewer pressure. Yeah. You know, one, one little clarification about AUC, rock and partial rock. The difference between partial rock and rock is not about turning it into a significance test. You can use exactly the same bootstrapping approach that we use in partial rock for traditional rock. I don't want to say classic rock. Um, people have misused Rock AUC from the outset. Okay, Rock AUC as a measure of model performance is massively prevalence dependent. And so it is not a very good metric of, of model performance. But if you bootstrap the input data, the points going into the calculation of the, of the curve and its area, then you can ask whether that is significantly elevated above 0.5 for traditional rock or something less than 0.5 for partial rock. So the real difference between those two methods is that partial rock applies a criterion of omission error and basically says that predictions with more than that amount of omission error are going to be ignored. Yeah. So, so at the very least, those techniques should be used as significance tests. Now you probably could use AUC as a measure of discrimination between yes and no, if of course you had good no data, absence data. You could use it as a measure of performance, but I would use a statistical test of significance, yes or no, separately from the performance test. So first question is, am I doing better than random? Second question is, is my performance good enough for the needs of this study? And, and that's kind of the, the first two filters that uh, we set up in the KUENM algorithm. Yep. Shall we pass to another question? Again. Uh, this is 2579. 2579. There we go. Hi, and thanks for the talks. Researchers are normally using 
correlative models because of many reasons, such as availability of data, ease of use, and so on, and or build an ensemble model out of them. But what about hybrid models? Aren't they better approaches than correlative models? Okay, jump in. <laughs> it's a it's a tricky question. Uh, I think, as always, models are models. Uh, how to say they're better or not depend on many things. Uh, one of those is the availability of data, which is the most important one. Uh, because if you don't have data that is, or quality data, you, you just cannot use some other algorithms. And that happens a lot with hybrid models. Hybrid models usually require some other data. Uh, I'm thinking in MIHCLIM, it uses a cellular automaton and it requires you to know uh, dispersal ability of the species. Uh, it makes you, uh, it, you have to, do, to make a lot of uh, sometimes difficult decisions in using this algorithm. And I don't know if when you don't have the data, like when you don't know enough about the species, that's going to be better than a correlative or as the students say, more simpler, <laughs> simpler models. Uh, it's, it's hard to do a mixed, uh, a hybrid model and a mechanistic model even more. So I'm thinking in most of my colleagues in South America and we don't have those data. We don't know enough about our biodiversity to be able to to prepare these models. I, I've been working with um, Caribbean toads for like, I think probably five, six years already or seven. Uh, every time I'm trying to learn more about them, but there's, since I am not doing too much with them, I don't know more than I can read. And none of those readings have helped me to know better about certain things that I need to use in a hybrid model, for instance. So it's, it's a tricky question because yes, they can inform you better about the potential distribution or dispersal of a species considering even climate change when you have enough data. And when you know where populations are right now and how it's the state of that. But if you don't have those that information, it's it's not going to be better than a, a correlative model or a assemble model. Uh, I I don't think that comparison is is fair. Yeah. Um, later in the course, in the frontiers section, we'll have a talk from Michael Kearney, and he's certainly a leader in this in this area of mechanistic models. And so it'd be really interesting to see his perspective on, on mechanistic versus correlative models or models that, that draw something out of each of them. Uh, we'll also see a presentation from Laura Jimenez and Jorge Soveron about a different sort of uh, hybridization of, of these models where they use the, the physiological uh, information as a prior in fitting a Bayesian model of, a Bayesian correlative model of the ecological niche. Uh, so stay tuned for those uh, talks. Um, but yeah, I think your general point, Marlon, is right on, which is that, um, going to a more complex, more sophisticated modeling platform could be great, but only if you have the data and information to support going to that more sophisticated platform. Because, you know, fitting some model that's more sophisticated when you don't have detailed parameter values and you are guessing or you are estimating or you're using values from related species or something like that, that's not going to tell you very much or it might even mislead you. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's this phenomenon, like, it's not a phenomenon. It's something that happens to you when you're trying to do these more complex things. And you start thinking, okay, I'm going to tell that this species is able to move one, two, and three pixels in these uh, probabilities. And then you think about, and you say, oh, wait, wait, uh, but here is a mountain, and this is a, a, a very flat portion of land. Is it going to be the same? And you start thinking all the complications that, that happen at populational level, and you see that there's no perfect model that considers all those things. And the reason is that you don't have all the information for all those things. Mm -hmm. And there's not gonna be. We need to like, get to a complexity that we are allowed to based on the information that we have. I was going to say it's interesting that ecological niche modeling started on the premise that we have no knowledge about where species are. We have knowledge of uh, occurrences from, I don't know, a span of 50 years. What can we do with those, given that we also have climatic data? And, and that's, that's what it, I mean, it cannot, trying to use niche model, ecological niche modeling, the way it has been it has been developed for to answer population level questions uh, is is a bit I don't know um, it's, I think it's a misuse of a method and but this question is about why not using more complex models if these are too simplistic well for the same the reason <laughs> you you mentioned that we don't have information for complex models and yeah if you do if you have information or that you can use to fit complex models, and your question requires complex models, then by all means, launch into that. Um, but yeah, it's it's all about, it's data driven. You know, and by all means, there are things that can be done with mechanistic models that are fantastic, providing, of course, you had the, enough information that's sufficiently accurate and precise to be able to set up the mechanistic model. For example, with correlative models, as you have seen and will see uh, week after next, we are constrained to the set of conditions that actually exists. And we may want to ask in, we may, may want to ask questions about the behavior of our species under sets of conditions that are non-analogous, that do not exist. And you know, we've talked about, about um, what it means to, well, we're going to talk more about what it means to transfer a model, but we've talked about it some already. Transferring a model to a set of conditions that is substantively, substantively outside of the set of conditions where you calibrated the model is rough. It is not easy, it's not straightforward. Um, and mechanistic models may very well allow us to, to ask those questions. Okay. Obviously with their assumption sets, but that, that may be a, a significant substantive advantage, and it may say in, a, in some cases, you have to use a mechanistic model, or you may have to use both, or you may want to hybridize them. <laughs> okay, let's, let's look at another question. Um, I have, I wrote down three numbers, but now I don't remember what the questions were about. Um, so let's see, I have uh, 2596. There we go. Uh, Please, my question is this. Do the predictors to retain in the model depend on the number of occurrence data we use in the model? Okay. So I, select, I selected a few short questions. And yep. the short answer to this is, 
yes, you should not have more variables for sure. You should not have more variables than occurrences. And ideally, you should have a lot more occurrences than variables. So using, you know, the, um, the default 19 bioclean variables when you have 20 occurrences or when you have 25 or 30 occurrences that's that's not a good approach um but yes number of predictors has to be a lot smaller <laughs> than the number of occurrences that's my short answer <laughs> let's make it a little longer marlon you want to <laughs> go at it or you want me to comment just uh, I just want to say, and this is very important, especially if you're using uh, distinct or multiple response types when you're right, calibrating your models, because each response type will increase uh, the simpler ones once more, the number of variables, and the complex ones a lot more. Yes. So you may, may end up with, like, if you use linear quadratic thresholds, hinges in accents, for instance, you may end up with, if you start with four variables, you, you can have even 80. If you use, if Maxent decides to use all of them based on the entropy it gets. Yeah. So imagine doing a model with that amount of variables. It's kind of crazy. So that, that's a very, very good and important thing to think about before, before running your model. More variables doesn't mean better models. Sometimes it's the other way around. It's it's meaningful variables and non-correlated variables, non non-collinear variables, the ones that probably contribute the more to 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 your model. Kind of turning the answer the other on its head. If we have very few occurrence data, we're going to pick up on only the major course um, obvious relationships to environmental variables. And so we may have a species where six or 10 environmental dimensions participate in some non-zero way in shaping the niche. But if we have very few occurrence data, we're only gonna perceive the a few of those and they'll be the biggest effect ones probably. If we have lots more occurrence data, we're gonna start being able to perceive those more minor effects, those little adjustments of one percentage point or two percentage points. You know, the, the phrase in English is the devil is in the details. And so, you know, you can think about it pretty clearly if you say, well, you know, here are my 10 occurrence points. Well, if I look at, you know, a, a spectrum of temperature values from cold to hot, maybe all of my occurrence data are over here. So I can pick that up pretty easily. If I add in another dimension like precipitation, I may be able to see that there's some negative relationship or positive relationship. But if there's a sixth or seventh dimension that just makes a small difference, I can only perceive that if I have lots of occurrence data. Okay, that one was good. Mona, give us another one. Okay, I have two, 26, 27. 26. There we go. On what does the cohort, cohort threshold depend on the omission rate? So this question, I'm not sure what cohort threshold means. I, I'm assuming it was in one of the presentations. Uh, I did search for the word cohort in the presentations, in the slides. I couldn't find it. So maybe it was said, <laughs> um, but I was gonna just simplify the question and say that um, the, thresh the way the relationship between the threshold and omission error is that we use an omission error value at which we threshold the model. So 
uh, in you know in the literature you see a 10% omission error that has been used as the threshold for to create the binary uh, model the binary predictions or the binary maps um, so I, I'll stop there because I, I want to hear if you if you came across the cohort, cohort threshold <laughs> terminology so I was a bit curious about this too I'm guessing that if it was mentioned, it was mentioned by Dan or, or Bob. Um, but certainly the, the threshold chosen depends on the omission rate because we usually choose a threshold minimizing the omission rate. Now, this is one of those things where if you appreciate the difference between presence data and absence data, the difference in terms of availability and the difference in terms of uh, reliability or believability, then you're probably going to, um, or you should use a, a method for thresholding that depends only on the omission rate. And so that's, that's the thresholding approach that we've talked about, where you essentially, you know, the basic logic is we're going to take the highest threshold, the most restricted area that is, that includes all of the occurrence points on which the model was based. And so that's essentially a statement that I have empirical evidence that the species is able to maintain populations down to this threshold. It may be able to go lower, but I have no empirical evidence of that. So that's what would be called a minimum training presence threshold. We have to modify that when we know that there is probably some error in our occurrence data set. And you say, oh, I have no error in my occurrence data set. <laughs> and I will say, oh, yes, you do. It may not be very much. You may have done a really good job of, of detecting the obvious errors, but there are errors in every data set. But if there is non-negligible error and it's error manifested as placing a given occurrence under environmental conditions that are not really in the species niche, then that minimum training presence threshold will be too low and both the estimate of the niche and the estimate of the potential distribution will be too broad. And so in a paper long, long ago before many of you were born, Mona and I and Jorge Silveron <laughs> uh, proposed a parameter E, and that parameter E was basically an estimate of the proportion of your occurrence data that have error that is meaningful enough that it could affect your um, your estimates of the niche. And so it's basically a measure of how clean versus dirty your data are. And E could go possibly as low as zero, as high as maybe 10%. If it's over 10%, you probably shouldn't be using those data. Um, but essentially what you use E for is in many, many section segments of this method, you use it in model calibration and thresholding and evaluation. For thresholding, what you say is, well, I'm not going to take the minimum training presence as my threshold, but rather I'm going to take, I'm going to adjust that upward. And I'm going to say, I want to know the suitability level that corresponds to 100 minus E percent of the training occurrence data. So it may be the threshold that includes 99 or 95% of the occurrence data. And that's essentially allowing some of those points effectively to be counted as outliers. 
and to be discounted from the analysis. Third question, Mona. Oh, third question. Um, just, just because from time to time we have to reiterate. Uh, so question 2631, which package ENM eval or KU ENM is better for the evaluation of model performance. When should we use one or another? Ah. That's, that's, it's a pity that Bob couldn't be with us. Um, <laughs> I won't answer that one. <laughs> well, the answer, you asked the question. <laughs> well, Marlon, you want to answer? You uh, need to answer? <laughs> okay, I will answer. And essentially, what you need to do is analyze what each package does and think very carefully about which features are important to you in your study. There are differences, certainly. For example, and correct me if I'm wrong, but ENM eval, I think, does a better job or a more, more comprehensive job with taking the input occurrence data and splitting them up into interesting spatial subsets. <clears throat> KUENM uses perhaps a more comprehensive set of criteria for choosing models because it includes model significance, model performance, and model complexity. So there are differences between these. Um, they relate to probably the, the generic workflows that different labs use. Uh, they certainly relate to um, differences temporally. You know, ENM eval was published several years before KUENM, uh, and some of the methods evolved along the way. Um, so I, I think both are valid. Um, I would have my preferences, uh, but that's based on me wanting to choose models based on significance, performance, and uh, simplicity. And so KUENM gives me that. Doesn't mean you couldn't impose that on ENM eval. Um, but I think you need to, you need to ask this question in the context of a specific study and see where your study falls out as far as the differences between the techniques and the differences between the workflow in the two, in the two packages. Exactly. <clears throat> if, uh, and that's related to another question which asked for the difference between the two packages. Well, Town said some of them. Uh, I would say uh, the, the way in which data is partitioned for training and testing matters. Uh, and especially ENM about it's, it's a special because it partitions the background as well. So it does not consider the entire background when you are doing the calibration. Uh, for the training test, for the training model. And that may be advantages sometimes, depending on your question. Now, I cannot think right now about one in, in particular, but sometimes you may want to do that. KM doesn't do, doesn't do that. It considers the entire environmental con set of environmental conditions in the calibration area. And that's because KUENM is based on the idea that the partition between the the um, between the training and and testing data is random, right? Exactly, exactly. So it doesn't make much much sense to partition the background that way as well, like in small squares in the entire region or stuff like that. So uh, that's that's one important difference. And the other difference may be uh, it's related to how they work. KNM basically works in your working directory, and ENM eval it's it's saving all that information in your uh, R session. So you may be able to test a lot more models with KNM, 
than with uh, ENM above. Whether you want to do that or not, it's it's a different question. It depends on a lot of factors. And it's at, as Town said, uh, both are, I, I consider both options correct when when people use them in in publications. Uh, and that's always good to have a good understanding of the method because the user can say and why the, the reviewer can say and why you didn't test for this or something like that but you have to have an answer that's mm -hmm. the only thing and i think it's not that difficult so i i, I won't i won't pick i'd rather compare them i i find it very frustrating when reviewers say why didn't you use this package? Why did you use that package or the, the, the graphic user interface? Why didn't you use this package? Well, that's not the question. The question is, why didn't you take this methodological step? Now that may lead you to use a particular package that does that methodological step particularly well or conveniently or easily. So we could very easily set KUENM up to calibrate only on spatial subsets of a landscape. So like a checkerboard, like ENM eval does, we could set that up in a GIS and feed into KUENM the background data and the presence data only from you know the black squares on the checkerboard but it's certainly more uh, user friendly feasible and quite a bit more sophisticated to do that in in eval so you know as reviewers i think we should focus on not why didn't you use this platform or this workflow but rather why didn't you use this step, this, this particular manipulation or particular um, step in an analysis? Yep. One last question. Mm, there is one question here. That there are multiple questions, actually. Uh, Pick one. Well, there is one question that says, is there a perspective to implement other algorithms in KUNM? It's always announced that they're going to do that in ENM above. I think they, they already have at least BioClim and, and Max in, in ENM above. So they, they do have at least two. I think they're always improving ENM above. Uh, I don't know if, look, I am kind of the, the maintainer of KUNM. I don't know if if I am gonna be able to to implement other algorithms, and I'm I don't know if I want to do that <laughs> because it's so complicated to think about all possibilities in just one algorithm, especially this one, which has too many options. That I don't know if it's worth. Probably it's better to have a different package that does well that with GLMs, that does that well with ellipsoids, that does that well with like. With different other algorithms and then like why do you have to create a consensus like wh why do you have to have that you can present different but it, they are different ideas they are oranges and apples they cannot be mixed so present them it's good to have variability it's good to be able to see which ones say what and which ones say the other way like the other thing so i don't know if i'm going to do that in KUNM. i don't know if i'm interested if some, if sometime in the future someone else takes my hand and starts to be the maintainer, and if that person wants to be <clears throat> working on this kind of problems, then probably yes. But right now, I don't think so. <laughs> also, remember, modeler has <clears throat> been presented earlier in the course. Modeler gives you the possibility of comparing among algorithms. Um, and also KUENM code is all there for whomever wants to work with it. Yeah. So if, you know, I mean, Marlon's got a, a doctoral dissertation that's focused on, on experimental physiology of aquatic plants. 
So he's got other things to do. And if, if somebody's really, really motivated about extending KUENM to other algorithms, do it. That'd be great. <laughs> you know, that's why we do open source software development. Yep. Uh, there was there was one question. Like oh, there was two questions, really quick, uh, uh, and about KNN because I can talk about that one. It's uh, twenty six eighteen, and the next one is also very similar. And the question is: Is KNN able to include the daphological variables or categorical variables? I think in general, yes, you can do that. You just have to be uh, a little bit more cautious and go to the argument that is called ARCs and read the details how to do it. I didn't implement it directly because I don't like to include uh, categorical variables because we have talked about like the potential problems that they like can originate in your model. And I don't really know if that will be a good niche model, but you can do it if you're interested in more distribution you have a good a comprehensive sampling of your species across distinct uh, 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 soil types or stuff like that then you can use it you just have to be uh, just have to read the details of uh, the functions that create the models but uh, just always think about whether it's convenient or not to use them yeah yeah I, i'm not a big fan of using categorical variables just because what I've seen is that oftentimes you see the footprint of the category in your final model outputs. And I don't believe that in general, in the natural world, there are fine grained geographic borders where it's, you know, A out to here and then B from there on. That just doesn't exist generally. So yes, you can include categorical variables. Probably most of the time you either shouldn't or you should go, you should do your model with and without the categorical variable just to see the effect. And what you should really be looking for is quantitative measures that correlate with those, those categories. So, you know, there are, there are now uh, quantitative measures of soil characteristics or quantitative measures of vegetation. And those are very rich, much more information rich uh, data streams than what you have available if you just say, you know, type A versus type B versus type C. Okay. We are beyond our um, hour, so we should probably stop. Those of you who had questions for Dan Warren, I will put up his uh, written answers to your questions. Uh, he's at a very, very inconvenient time zone right now for joining us at, at nine in the morning in central time in the United States. Um, so check out the additional materials link for this session and you'll see Dan's answers to your questions. Uh, again, next week, live session, Monday at 9 a.m. Uh, Central Time, uh, which is GMT minus five. Um, and the links to that, to that uh, live session are on Facebook, Twitter, and, and, and your email for those of you who asked for an email uh, notification. So as always, uh, Mona and Marlon, thanks very much. And everybody have a good weekend. And we'll see you, I'll see you Monday, and probably see you guys next week.